If you haven't experienced Mardi Gras, you're in, in for a real treat. It's true, un unadulterated make-believe, and everybody likes make-believe. It's fun, it's great fun, not only on the street, but in the dances, and it, it's, a, it's a great uh, festival. Most cities have a festival that lasts about a weekend, maybe, or a week, but not Mobile. It's two and a half weeks here. Mobile does everything a little bit over the top. The Mobile Connell Museum is in the, under the auspices of the Mobile Connell Association. It is privately funded. There's no government money at all paid into this museum. It's strictly by contribution by citizens of our city. The collection is made principally of um, Mardi Gras trains, collars, costumes, crowns, scepters, such as that. There must be there were like 14 galleries in the museum. And just, this is just an example of what you see here, the intricateness, the beauty of what we have on display. This train was, was made for uh, Virginia, Oliver, then Antwerp. And she chose as the theme of her train the various members of her family who were king or queen. And they're represented by the crowns that they wore and their initials on each one, going up the thing with hers at the very top. But this one is so heavy that the people, that when it was made, she had difficulty pulling it. And it has ball bearings on the bottom, so it will slide easier. It's quite elaborate, much more so than a lot of them. But they're all very elaborate, but this one this goes over the top. It's wonderful. We're very fortunate to have it here in the museum. Mobile was settled by the French, and it was discovered by the, by the Spanish in 1519. Alonzo Pineda came sailing in, into Mobile Bay. Fast forward to 1702, and the French came. Bienville came, and he established the city, the town. It's a 27-mile bluff, which is up the river from Mobile, from where we are now. And in, that was in 1702. And in 1711, they moved it to the present site of Mobile, and that's where we've been ever since. It first started as, as a religious thing, and then they, they're all very religious, and I'm sure they had probably had a, a Jesuit or some type of preacher with them. The, the carnival bit of the Mardi Gras or the celebration goes back to the French and the Roman Catholicism that they brought with them and the celebration of all before the eve of a, a, of a holy day. The Beef Gras Society was formed in 1710 and it finally, I think it was about 1830 before it finally folded. The Calbay and Derakin Society, which was formed by the, the first people that started this, the silliness of the celebration, the type with the floats and the parades that we have today. And they were, a bunch of young men were imbibing on the, on the uh, steamboats down in the, uh, the cotton, cotton boats. And uh, it was New Year's Eve and they decided they, were, they had a little too much to drink and they were walking down the street by a hardware store and they were all these rakes and hoes and cowbells and everything hanging out front. And they went up and got them and they started hitting, dragging them through the street and ringing bells and rakes and making noise and they wound up at the mayor's house, which is right down, used to be right down the street here. And he, he invited them in. Well, that was so much fun, they decided to do it again and again about the third year. They said, well, we need to get this thing going. We call ourselves the Cowbellion de Rakin Society, Cowbells and Rakes. And they, they survived uh, till about, they paraded until probably the 1880s. And then they stopped parading. They blessed any faint of them, they were gone by 1910 or 1912. The next one we found it was a strike was the Independent Society, and it was founded in 1842. It is still alive and well, still a very, very vibrant, very, um, org very organized organization right now. Once the war was over, Mobile was uh, occupied by federal troops, and one gentleman named Joe Kane decided he'd kind of stir things up, and he dressed as an Indian chief, Salabama Remico. And which was Choctaw who had never been defeated in battle. So, and he got on the coal wagon with some of his cohorts, and they had tin pans and, pan, and made all this noise riding through town, and they dressed up like Indians, and they rode through town to the chagrin of the federal troops. Well, that was the beginning of the, the start of all this madness. It's a wonderful thing for the whole city. In the last, I guess, 30 years, it's become a, more of a thing where everybody participates. Back in the, oh, before World War I or II, or back in those days, it was really a little, a little of the elitism of, of the people with the parades and whatnot, but now everybody can afford it. 
and people are willing to spend the money to do it. Because it's, it's not cheap to put these on, and this has been a great catalyst. It's been a wonderful uh, economic boost to the communities. The uh, economic impact is roughly $450 million. And you think, well, how in the world could it be? But you've got these floats that all cost to build. You've got the people to paint them. You've got the people to make the costumes, and you've got to buy the costumes. And some of these organizations have two and 300 people in them. And so this, it's got to be a pretty big parade. It's quite an impact on the city. And everybody has a good time. Like I say, it's a wonderful time. Everything you see in here was made right here in Mobile. We have very artistic, very talented people here, very, very talented you know, seamstresses and, and designers and people that can draw and think up and imagine. And they people say, well, how long does it take to do all this stuff? I said, well, every year it takes at least, hmm, about time it takes to make a baby, about nine months to do any of this stuff. It just takes time and a lot of, a lot of thought and a lot of, it's a lot of enjoyment for a lot of people. But uh, it's, it's really an integral part, like a heart, a heart, like a heartbeat. It's just part of Mobile.